All right, I think I'm going to get started. So I'm going to take you on a little journey today through the scientific mind and through the indigenous mind. I called my talk The Dirt Cure, and that's still basically the talk, but I shifted it a little bit to terrain because that's kind of how I'm talking about dirt and soil and our relationship with the earth more now. So I'm going to start with these words from an Aboriginal elder. He said, people talk too much. And when they're not talking, they're thinking too much. How will they learn to hear the voice of the earth in the sound of the trees? How will they hear the voice of Mother Earth in the flow of the water? We are living in a very linear, scientific, rational world right now and you know as an MD I have certainly partaken of that and you know I am a product of that in many ways and I think every day now when I open Facebook or whatever um, we're just seeing all these like all the more and more climate events that are happening that we've kind of known were coming so I'm really interested right now in how we're going to be able to work in nonlinear ways um, and outside of this kind of linear rational model without totally ignoring it to confront the kinds of issues we're going to be, we are dealing with right now. And I love this quote from John Muir, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So I think more and more we're learning that. And I want to kind of take you through my journey from my scientific mind into my indigenous mind. So how I always used to start my talks and how um, I kind of wrote my book was on this idea that everything is connected. And I think this is old hat to everybody in this room, right? Microbial health is part of soil health. Soil health leads to plant health. Plant health and animal health are connected. And of course, plant, animal, and ecosystem health are related to human health. Bless you. And I would talk about our internal terrain, which was our microbiome, right? And our, all of our organ systems, gut, skin, lungs, immune, and so on how they're connected to our external terrain, soil, air, water, seeds, plants, animals, and other living organisms, germs and microbes, even synthetic compounds, and, and all the things, okay? And this is what I said would make health, right? And it, and it is a big part of our health. How do we balance our internal terrain with our external terrain? And how are they connected? And of course, a lot of that happens through food and nutrition, right? Because food is the embodiment of our terrain. We eat animals and plants, animals live on plants, and plants themselves live on soil, sun, water, rocks, right? And the microbes and mycorrhizae are facilitating nutrition for plants, and for us it's this huge, beautiful symphony. And then, and then what I came to many years ago was, okay, Dirt is the foundation of our resilience. And I use dirt very intentionally because a lot of people who, who do soil are like, oh, why are you using the word dirt? So I, I'm a disruptor. <laughs> and so for me, I, you know, if anybody is not feeling a little uncomfortable with what I'm saying, then I'm probably not doing my job well. But you know, for me, I wanted to kind of turn things on its head, right? Because being dirty is considered a bad thing. And by the way, in the UK, they had to change the name of my book because dirt means like poop. <laughs> They're like, no, 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 you can't call it that there. But, um, <laughs> but, but for me, I said dirt because, you know, we think of germs as bad. And I said, okay, well, germs and microbes are good for us. Soil and what grows in it is important. And, and time in nature and getting dirty in that way are important. So I'm going to use the word dirt, the dirt cure. And that's going to be how I'm going to explain the foundation of health, which is resilience, right? And that balance between the internal terrain and the external terrain. And, and food, the embodiment of that terrain. Literally, food is, is sunshine and water and these minerals, these eternal minerals that, that have been here for eternity, that come in, of, in us and then go out of us again as we're alive and also after we're alive, right? So, so 
really it is the embodiment of everything in the natural world. And we bring that into our bodies and internalize it. It's, it's very, it's beautiful, it's physical, it's scientific, it's also very spiritual, right? And so I want to, though, take a moment here and kind of go through a little exercise in science and the scientific mind. Um, because a lot of people used to say, well, what's the difference between a germ and a microbe? Does anybody know? So really, it's just um, that a germ is a pejorative term for microbe, right? It just has to do with our own spin. We, we, it's just how we feel about it, um, <laughs> really. So our body is actually made up mostly of germs and microbes. And it turns out that they control our brain development and function and behavior in many ways. They actually communicate when you see here diet, the gut microbe, and epigenetics. That's food and microbes are actually in communication with our DNA, how our DNA is read. And although it doesn't change the actual sequence of our DNA, it is heritable to our children how, when, when, our, when our food and our microbes interact with our DNA. So DNA is in, commu our, our, our microbes are even in communication with our DNA and change how our DNA is read and change things for our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren's DNA, potentially, okay? We know that gut germs seem to be playing a role in, in multiple sclerosis, okay? And actually, it's thought, I don't want to get too deep into any one of these things, but, but it's thought that actually probiotics are going to be one of the um, up-and-coming treatments for, for MS because um, the, way, the way that the gut, the gut microbes basically um, are in communication with gene transcription factors that control the immune system. We even, has anyone heard of psychobiotics? So this has been in the news quite a bit. Psychobiotics are basically different microbes that directly influence mood. So anxiety, depression, some of the very, actually very difficult to treat conditions, psychiatric conditions, um, are influenced very significantly by microbes, by our microbes. And the, this is actually how pharmaceutical companies are now really investing their time and money and attention is towards these kinds of treatments, microbes, for, for mood disorders. We know, too, that for those of you who have heard of the hygiene hypothesis, right, there was this time where we saw, okay, kids who uh, grow up on farms are less likely to have allergies and asthma. And so they said, yeah, because it's so dirty, right? There's like a lot of microbes there. Turns out that researchers said, hey, you know what? Let's actually check. Let's check. Are these micro, are there really more microbes there? So they looked in an urban apartment and they compared it to a farm. And which do you think had more microbes? Actually, they were the same, equal, okay? But what was the difference on the farm? Diversity, right? Okay, so what it is, is not just about being dirty or being, being exposed to, to microbes. It's about being exposed to many different kinds of microbes. Okay, and that is actually part of what our immune systems need because our immune systems are very social and they like to meet and greet lots and lots of different foods and microbes and basically that's what makes them healthy and balanced. Okay, whereas if they only see one or two kinds, and that's how they develop, then every new microbe, every new compound that they see, they're gonna, it's gonna be like, oh no, is this, a, is this an enemy? I'm gonna have to like attack it. I have to like mobilize the defenses. So basically diversity is, is the key, right? So being exposed to lots of different kinds of microbes. And so we've kind of come to this idea that bacteria could be okay, right? Like can you imagine 30 years ago, if you would have gone to the doctor and said, I'm going to take a billion colonies of bacteria in a pill every single day, like, they would have been like, you're going to die. <laughs> you know, you're crazy. So we've kind of come to the idea, okay, bacteria could be good, but what about viruses? Viruses are bad, right? Well, turns out maybe not. Several years ago now, in the journal Nature, there was a paper looking at the microvirome. 
and they found that mice that were treated with murine norovirus, which is a fairly benign virus for mice, who were germ-free, okay, and this means they were treated, they are, their gut microbiomes and their body microbiomes were wiped out completely by antibiotics, okay? I mean, we can discuss the ethics of that separately, but this is the study. The study was germ-free mice given murine norovirus, what happens? And what happened was normally what would happen in a germ-free mouse or in any of us when we have antibiotics is that our our gut physiology goes kind of haywire. Our immune physiology goes haywire. And that can last for up to one year after one course of antibiotics, okay? But in these mice who had the murine norovirus, everything went off without a hitch, okay? Meaning the, you wouldn't have even known that they were germ-free because the, the virus, the murine norovirus, took over for the bacteria. And, and it said, basically, it mimicked the effect of commensal bacteria in the gut. So what we're finding is that viruses actually play a role probably in many parts of immunity and of gut physiology and probably of neurophysiology as well, just as bacteria do. But in this case, the virus was like, hey, got your back, no problem, you know, you're going to get rid of the bacteria, we'll take over for you. And we're learning also that people who have had mumps uh, early in life are about half as likely to develop ovarian cancer later in life. So there, and, and initially it was just an association. Now there's actually a mechanism that's been described. And it's basically that, mum, that an antigen in, in mumps virus looks very similar to an antigen on ovarian cancer. So it kind of just like tips off our immune system, trains it to be like, this is probably not a great thing. If you see it, you know, you need to deal with it. And what ends up happening is that we kill off, you know, because all the time we're making cancer cells in our body. That's normal. It's a normal thing to be making cancer cells and our immune system's just taking care of them all the time. That's just, it's like a balance, you know, like any, like any balance. And when so you kind of need to flat, no, your immune system needs to know how to flag certain things, and mumps trains the immune system for that particular kind of cancer. And we're actually learning also about oncolytic viruses, so viruses that actually can treat, treat very difficult to vanquish cancers, like glioblastoma multiforme or pancreatic cancer. So injecting these viruses into tumors or certain kinds of cancers and seeing that these viruses actually help kill cancer um, by stimulating the immune system in certain ways. So here we're kind of learning, okay, like viruses may actually benefit us in certain ways. And obviously, you know, they're not necessarily all good, but they're definitely not necessarily all bad either, right? As with bacteria. But what about parasites? You know, like, no one wants worms, right? Those are definitely bad. So it turns out that people who have had uh, a strongyloides infection in this aboriginal community, strongyloides is a kind of intestinal worm, um, were actually 61% less likely to develop type 2 diabetes as compared to people who hadn't previously been infected. It's been looked at also in inflammatory bowel disease where people are actually on purpose infected or given either deactivated or not deactivated parasites. And what has been found, helminths are intestinal worms, okay, they're parasites. Um, and people have had inflammatory bowel dis disorders. I just took this quote out because it was so mind-blowing. It says, the relationship between humans and nematodes of the gastrointestinal tract can be considered as a mutualism rather than a typical parasitism. So we need to be in relationship with these organisms in some cases. Again, are they all good? No. But are they all bad? No. OK. I'm going to take questions at the end. And in this case, this was a study looking in celiac disease at giving hookworm infection, actually infecting people, this is an academic study, in infecting people with hookworm who had celiac disease to see if they could better tolerate gluten. 
And the interesting thing I took away from this actually was if you look at A, okay, that is pre-trial. All right, and you see that the, the dots are all kind of low on that, on that slanted line. It's lower biodiversity of organisms. If you look to the B graph, it says post hookworm, okay? They've now been infected with parasites. And look at all those dots, right? All those points are basically an increase in all different kinds of organisms that were not added to them. They only got an increase in, I mean, they only had hookworm basically introduced. And all of these other bacteria increased. So there's this very interesting phenomenon where diversity begets diversity. Okay, which is a very nonlinear concept. So I just want to point that out. Um, and not what people anticipated, actually. Yet, we live in this health paradigm with all of this data, all this information, where the paradigm is avoid, 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 avoid. And that's based in germ theory, our old friend Louis Pasteur who said, diseases are caused by microorganisms. These small organisms, too small to see without magnification, invade humans, animals, and other living hosts. Their growth and reproduction within their host can cause disease. So this happened, you know, Louis Pasteur is the father of pasteurization, among other things. And at the time that he was kind of coming out with this groundbreaking research, people were so upset and afraid of bacteria that they stopped eating yogurt and sourdough bread and all these things which we now celebrate <laughs> and maybe many of us have just ate. Th thus is kind of the conundrum of science and kind of the linear and rational mind is that, not that it's bad, not that it's fully untrue, it isn't, but it's possible for more than one thing to be true at the same time, right? And, it's more, and things might be more complex than they seem. And it's actually caused quite that whole theory and our attachment to being very linear about that theory led to this war on the microbiome that we are still living right now where, you know, we see that babies that are born by C-section versus vaginal birth, what's the prevailing bacteria that you will find in their gut? Skin bacteria. So normally... Babies are born if it, when I say normally, but I don't want to say it like that, but you know, if babies are born vaginally, then the prevailing bacteria in their gut at birth will be vaginal bacteria. That's on purpose. Maybe it grosses everybody out here, but I'm just going to say it like it is, okay? If babies are born by C-section, the prevailing bacteria is skin bacteria. It's different. And that's what's seeding their gut. Does it stay different forever and ever? Not really. But it's a window period of time where they have a different bacteria. And there are different health risks associated with being born by C-section that don't come along with vaginal birth. Does it mean every kid born vaginally is going to be totally healthy and not run into those risks and babies born by C-section won't? No, none of that. Okay? We're not talking in linear truths here. Okay? This is a nonlinear talk. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, formula feeding versus breastfeeding. Also, there are all kinds of different things that happen to the microbiome. I'll give you one example because that could be a whole talk in and of itself, a whole conference, in fact. But there, there's an aspect of breast milk that was always thought that's not digestible. Okay, It's not digestible by the human body, by infants. And, of course, it was always thought, oh, this is like some dumb mistake of the body that's like throwing in this non-digestible thing, whatever. We don't care about that. It turns out that that particular non-digestible sugar in breast milk actually supports a very particular, very fragile microbe that causes the baby's gut to be less leaky, okay? Naturally, babies have very permeable guts. That's normal, okay? And this particular aspect of breast milk feeds a particular bacteria, as soon as there's no breast milk anymore, that bacteria disappears. But it protects their guts in many, many ways. Just one example. I mean, we could go into many more, okay? 
So there are all these ways, obviously chronic use of antibiotics. Over lunch, I was just saying how I basically was on antibiotics for ear infections from when I was a year old to when I was 12 years old. I mean, very chronically on antibiotics. That was just normal. You know, I was a baby of the 70s and like antibiotics were just kind of handed out like candy. And I won't say that is not still happening. You know, not by me, but it's still, it's still very much a thing. Things like acetaminophen, ibuprofen, steroids, vaccines, all these pharmaceuticals, we don't know fully what they're doing to the microbiome, but we know that they affect it, okay? Processed food and pesticides. I mean, we know that just for example, like glyphosate was first actually patented as an antibiotic. So as we get any traces of that, we're getting traces of antibiotics all the time if we're not you know, able to avoid it. Antibacterial soap, bleach, this is a big part of the average person's life right now. And of course, too much time indoors. So here we are living this kind of war on the microbiome in spite of science that is telling us otherwise. And this is sort of like still hearkening back to science that was just not fully developed. And it's kind of, I would say, the pitfall of being too attached to this one language of describing the world, which is science, okay? So I know I'm saying something kind of challenging right now um, for at least some people, but if we're too attached to a particular way of seeing things and we become dogmatic about it and we think there's such a thing as science being settled, then we're going to run into trouble and we have run into trouble. And of course, we're seeing the paradigm is changing because of probiotics. We now understand, we're starting to see a lot of research on things like oncolytic viruses or soil-based organisms, right? So these probiotics that are based in soil organisms or nematode therapy that I talked about. Fecal transplant, who has heard of fecal transplant, right? Okay, so now this is pretty widespread. Basically, it is exactly what it sounds like you're taking stool and turning it into either enema or pill and in ingesting it or having it put into you, okay? And it is actually so effective for certain kinds of infections like C. difficile that it actually, in a study a couple years ago in Scandinavia, they had to stop the trial because it was considered unethical not to give fecal transplant to people who had C. diff infection. That's how effective it is. And the same with vaginal microbial transfer for babies who are born by C-section. Who knows how effective this will be? I mean, I, but I think it's an acknowledgement of like in a, the very slow like 180 turn that maybe it's a good thing to be exposed to microbes, okay? But what it all comes down to is that our bodies crave biodiversity. What is biodiversity really but community? And really what it is showing us in a way, scientifically, is that we want to be in community with the natural world. And this whole idea got me really thinking because there's all this very beautiful data about time and nature that I included in my book and our health and well-being, okay? So we know, of course, that there's a huge amount of the world's biodiversity in soil and that a teaspoon of soil holds tremendous number of organisms. If that's not community, I don't know what is. And we know too that soil organisms, there are certain soil organisms like Mycobacterium vacai that actually make us happy and promote our well-being, okay? So there's this study where um, this oncologist noticed that um, in patients who were inoculated with this particular strain of bacteria, they had fewer symptoms with their cancer and improved emotional health, vitality, and cognitive function. And then it was looked at again, injected into mice, um, and those mice actually showed lower stress levels, both physiologically and behaviorally. And then there is this very Cool study I love because the mice were fed tiny peanut butter sandwiches, <laughs> and I just love that. Um, but they were, and they had this bacteria smeared on their, their sandwiches. And these mice had what they called a superhero effect. The superhero effect was that they could navigate a difficult maze twice as fast 
and with half of the anxiety behaviors of other mice. And it lasted for about three weeks, and then they needed to be re-inoculated, okay? Which means that we need to have regular, regular um, immersion, right, with soil and with these bacteria in these different ways. But then it got me thinking more, because there's a lot of things we're supposed to be scared of outside, right? Like sunshine, we should not be getting very much of. That's what we're told. So um, a study was published in 2014, and subsequent ones have come out since from the Karolinska Institute. That is the institute also that confers the Nobel Prize. So it's a pretty prestigious place. Followed 30,000 women over 20 years and found that the women who assiduously avoided sun exposure were twice as likely to die for any reason as those who didn't have sun. Okay? The risk, in a, in a subsequent study, they showed that the risk was similar to smoking. Avoiding the sun, like strictly avoiding the sun, was basically the same risk for dying as if you were smoking. Dermatologists hate when I present this. <laughs> they, really, they really hate it. OK, I will say here as a disclaimer, it's not a good idea to get sunburns, OK? So if you are someone who gets burned, it's important to like figure that part out and you know, either cover yourself or go out at different times of day or you know, whatever. But also, part of the sun exposure is actually having small amounts chronically is actually considered beneficial, as opposed to like, you know, having that one weekend at the beach where you like come home a lobster sort of thing. So that's far more dangerous. But the other thing about being outside and being in sunlight is, so who knows that in, in Korea, there's actually an epidemic of nearsightedness. 97% of young adult men are nearsighted. Okay, and so there's been a lot of exploration because there was a long period of time where we thought eyesight was really just genetic. No, it is not just genetic. It turns out that being outdoors, and they found this out completely by accident in this study about sports and other things, and it turns out being outdoors is a really important part of eye and eyesight development. How many hours a day do you think in this paper they recommended that um, children be outdoors? Three hours a day minimum. How many kids do you think right now are outdoor each day for three hours every day? Not many. OK. I'm a pediatric neurologist, and I can tell you not many. And we see all these studies, too. So I was looking at all this stuff, and I'm thinking, like, OK, there's all these ways that we're benefiting from nature. But then there are these other ways, too, that are really interesting. Like, nature enhances healing. So when a patient who had had surgery was in a hospital room where they overlooked trees versus a brick wall, they had shorter post-operative stays. They had lower um, post -sur they had fewer post-surgical complications, fewer negative comments in the nurse's notes. <laughs> um, I love that one. And less need for strong analgesics. That was just because that was just because they could see it was randomly, you know, selected for each group just based on the hospital, their view from their room, um, they, they actually had all these benefits, fewer complications, less need for analgesics, all of that. So what do you make of that, right? And interestingly, in this study, they looked at people in, a, in the dentist's office um, who either had a blank wall or a picture of nature. And what they found was it reduced anxiety subjectively, improved pain control, and patient satisfaction with their procedure if they even saw a picture of nature while they were in the chair. They were, rate, they were just rating their experience. They felt calmer. We know that nature improves focus. Children who play on highly natural school playgrounds, that's probably not turf, just like if we want to imagine, showed fewer attention and concentration problems and improved cognitive and physical functioning compared to children playing on less natural school playgrounds. And they perform better on standardized tests as well. So this really got me to thinking. And I was looking at the data on Shinrin-yoku. Who knows what that is? Forest bathing is what we call it here. Okay, And it's really just immersing yourself in the beauty of the forest. 
okay? So going in and having like a beautiful immersive forest experience in a regular way. And it's funny because we talk about it like it's a thing, but um, I was talking to someone from Japan who thought it was kind of hilarious that we all talk about it like it's this event, like forest bathing. They're like, that's just what we do. Like, it's just part of our culture, you know? And we make it seem like very ceremonial. Um, but all the data about forest bathing is really interesting because um, not only when people are in the beauty of the forest in a regular way, do they sleep better, do they feel calmer and happier, they have better focus, better executive function, okay? So all of those things are happening. Subjectively, they feel happier. But also, if you look at their blood, they actually have lower cortisol levels, so their stress hormones are lower. That makes sense, I guess. But also, they have increased natural killer activity. So natural killer sounds sound like bad things, but actually, they're part of your nonspecific immune system. They are actually, when I was talking before about how we are always like kind of taking care of cancer cells in our body as a normal part of our body. That's natural killer cells. That's part of what they do. And increased expression of anti-cancer proteins in our blood. So we're fighting cancer better by being in the forest, being in nature. So I thought that was really, really interesting because a lot of people say, oh, being outdoors, that's healthy because of the microbes, right? That's why we feel better there. Or being outdoors, it's because we need vitamin D. I want to mention about that sun study that um, it was not thought to be totally related to vitamin D at all. Vitamin D levels were measured, actually, for at least some portion of those people. It was not considered to be solely based on vitamin D levels because nothing is really that reductionist, right? Um, not in nature, for sure. But then looking at like, okay, people are feeling this sense of well-being. All these things regulate. Is there any drug you can think of, any treatment you can think of that does all of these things for, for us, for our bodies, and for our well-being? I mean, there's nothing, right? So it really got me thinking a lot. What's really happening when we're out in nature? So it basically took me on this journey and... and Part of my journey was not just for, for this particular, to answer this particular question, but I ended up doing a lot of studying with indigenous communities in South America and in Africa. And I started to learn a very different way of looking at our health, right? For the indigenous communities, and actually I also come from an indigenous community myself, but I was very disconnected from that in Morocco. But Indigenous communities, really, all of your health is based on your relationships. Relationship with yourself, relationship with the people around you, and relationship with your place. And that is, and that is basically the basis, okay, of, of your health and of your community's health. And... Physical health is considered downstream to your spiritual and emotional health. So this is a very different model from what we kind of usually learn in our society. But it got me thinking about a different way of looking at medicine. And so I started to talk and teach about terrain medicine. And here's where I kind of want to slide a little bit into our indigenous minds, okay? Because I think of terrain medicine as a conversation. And it includes what's happening in unseen way, okay? Like we'll talk about the unseen world and the seen world. And the unseen world can be what we're talking about in science, in physics, in quantum physics. It's not necessarily unscientific, but it does kind of speak in a different language. And it requires us to listen in a different way. So we know that this language is not a new language, but most of us are really trained not to speak it. And we have to really show up in a very different way than most of us have learned to do. Because the communication, this communication and learning how to listen is not always in words. And in this model, the human body isn't kind of a whole different array of like disembodied parts that all kind of live in one, you know, house. But it's connected. And this is actually, who's familiar with this? 
This is called the Chinese medicine wheel, okay? Or at least that's what I call it. <laughs> um, and basically what you see is that all the organ systems are correlated with emotions, with parts of the head or face, with seasons, with elements, and with times of day. And this is an incredible tool in a way, right? Or really observation and description of how our bodies are totally a part of nature and how nature is a part of our bodies. So if someone comes to me and they're waking up at you know 4 a.m. every day, I'll start talking to them about grief. And you would be surprised how often those people are going through a very difficult period of grief. And I can, instead of trying to like just give them something to help them sleep, I can also think about how I can support their grief. And very often, and this can be for children too. I mean, it's not, you know, you don't have to always be totally cognizant of it, that then they start sleeping well. Just for example, right? And knowing what parts of the body might be more vulnerable in the spring or the fall. So in ancient traditions, and this is true of Ayurveda as well, you know, Indian medicine, these are, these are thousands of year old traditions. We already are very much a part of the environment around us. Um, but it even goes a little deeper than that, okay? So who knows about the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio? So how are we connected to the natural world? How are some other ways that we are mirroring the natural world around us? So in this, in this model, we're looking at this spiral, and we see it in a rose. We see it in a hurricane. We see it in the inside of plants. We see it in the pattern of the sunflower seeds. We see it in the outer ear, the inner ear. We see it in the shape of the wave. And this ratio, too, is in the symmetry of the face, the symmetry of the body, in the way that plants grow, in the ratio of the bones of the finger and the bones of the arm as well. How is this? Because we're a part of nature, right? We are nature and nature is us. And we've evolved together. So I don't know how radical this is for people here because I've heard that people have been discussing plant intelligence um, over the course of this conference. Um, so I want to talk for a moment about plant intelligence because I think it's a really critical part of nutrition. And the reason that I think so is because nutrition is something that we are given, right? We receive that. And if we're able to see ourselves in relationship with plants and soil and uh, animals and earth, in, if we are in a relationship, okay, then we, and I think people here are thinking about how are we showing up in that relationship and how do we give back? And this is a very practical question at the same time that it's kind of a philosophical question as well. But I want to touch on the science of plant intelligence for a few minutes. So plants have a number of complex languages that include and are particularly chemical. They care for their offspring. They're involved in community. They help fellow ecosystem life forms when they're ill. They are creators and users of tools, which are primarily complex chemical compounds. And they're highly responsive to dangers to their structural integrity, which some people might call ego. Plant root systems, as I'm sure has been discussed extensively, have massive neural networks. They store memories. They analyze inputs and design responses. And they plan for the future. I want to show you this picture and this picture because this is a root and mycorrhizal pattern network and these, this is a neuronal network. And you can see how there is a really significant parallel between the two and in fact some people who are experts in plant consciousness say plants are far more intelligent than humans because they are not limited to the size of a skull, 
they, and over time, particularly like some of the older networks that could be like 100,000 years old are massive, really massive. Plants defend themselves in complex chemical ways. So when they're attacked by other plants, they repel them with precisely designed compounds, okay, for the particular plant. When they're overeaten by insects or by foraging animals, because plants actually grow better with about 18% for, uh, of foraging, they produce chemicals very specifically detailed to those particular predators, either to make them sick so that they won't continue to eat, or to mimic a particular pheromone of a predator to that predator so that they run away. Um, and they alert other plants in the ecosystem to this organism eating them. And those plants design and release pheromones to call in natural predators of the organism so that they're all protected. That's pretty amazing, I think. Plants help members of their ecosystem. So they sense when a member of their ecosystem is ill. Could be plant, could be animal, okay? When it's another plant, the plants produce necessary compounds and send them through mycelial networks to reach other plants that need them. When it's another animal, the plants send out chemical cues through their stomata to alert those animals to the location of the medicines that they need. Plants employ masterful chemical tactics. So the chemicals they create have to be exact in order to work. And they have to be released in exactly the right amount, whether parts per thousand, per million, per billion, or per trillion, in order to be effective. So tell me again, do we think plants are intelligent or not intelligent. Plants actually are possibly more intelligent than we are in certain ways, depending on how we want to measure, right? Another way, who here knows about plant signatures? Is this something that anyone knows about? Okay, so plant signatures, I really just touched on it very briefly, um, and I teach a lot more about this in my school, but plant signatures are the way, are a way that plants communicate what their medicine is. And probably you've seen at some point like the picture of like the inside of the carrot, you know, and how it looks like an eye and everyone's like, oh yeah, that's nice. Isn't that a funny coincidence? Well, here's the question. Is it actually a coincidence? So I have a whole course just on plant signatures. It's very extensive looking at the ways that plants communicate what their functions are. Um, for example, this is a black walnut, okay? And the way that it's cut, you can see the shape of the heart because walnut, and it's, you know, we know now, right, through whatever scientific investigation we've done recently, relatively, that the omega-3s are very important for heart health and can be very helpful for that. But also, if you look at the walnut itself, when it's a whole walnut, it looks kind of like the, the um, two hemispheres of the brain. And you look at it another way, it actually looks a little bit like, um, like it could look a little like a testicle. It's very helpful and important for fertility. Right. Also, it can look a little like a worm and that it's considered like the hull of the black walnut is useful, very useful for parasites. OK, if you look at a dandelion, what color would a yellow dandelion make you think that it could be helpful to our bodies? Urine and bile. Great. So dandelion is an incredible diuretic and it is also very supportive to the liver, all parts. Lady slippers, who's ever seen these? I saw these for the first time when I was in Cape Cod this summer. Like, it was maybe one of the most joyful moments of my life. They were like everywhere, they're so magical. The roots of lady slippers look like what to you? Anyone, what part of the body? Nerves, okay, like they look kind of like nerves. And lady slippers are very healing to the nervous system and actually are anticonvulsant. So they're right now they're endangered, so I don't use them as medicine very often in my practice, but they are used for seizures. And I know people, herbalists, who have who had their seizures controlled for many years on lady slippers. What does this look like to you in this picture? 
skin, okay? And comfrey is a known, very powerfully healing plant for skin. So why, is this all just a big funny coincidence, do you think? Like how do we, how, do, how did people all over the world who had no real communication with one another all know how to use these different plants independently of each other? Do you think like they just found like that, and the world was much more biodiverse, let's say, at that time. Do they just keep trying stuff and go, like, oh, oh, no, I'm dead. That time's not going to work. You know, I'm going to try this. Oh, maybe it helped. No, no, no. You know, I mean, you, you know, or was there some communication going on? You know, and this goes on and on. Like, for example, a plant that you find very commonly near your, you know, let's say that might grow in your yard is something you can safely usually have more of versus, let's say, so an example would be dandelion or like plantain. Has anyone here ever used plantain for a sting? I got stung by a wasp on my hand. I just picked a piece of plantain, chewed it, stuck it on my palm, pain went away immediately. And just so you know that that was not just like me biased because I'm like an herbalist too, I did the same for my son who got stung while he was mowing the lawn and he was like screaming and hysterical chewed it, I slapped it on his hand, totally stopped. So these are plants which we can use all the time. They're very accessible to us. The ones you have to go searching for are oftentimes the ones we use in much more sparing ways. But you can look at the stem of the plant and learn things about it. You can look at if it has thorns. Like if a plant, for example, a taste it, so like echinacea, for example, um, or spilanthes, numbs your tongue a little bit, you know it's going to be helpful for pain. Or if it has thorns, oftentimes it's going to be helpful for pain as well. So these are just some interesting plant signatures and ways that plants can talk to us, communicate, and I say talk, okay, but are communicating what we, how they can be healing in ways that are not in words, but may have to do with how plants are um, able to communicate and show us things. So how can we better understand the language of plants and of the earth. Because, and the reason that I'm asking this question is because I keep hearing people say things like, we just have to plant a million trees and that's gonna solve this problem. You know, if we would all just plant trees. Now, I am a tree lover and I am a tree hugger, okay? And I know some of you follow me on Instagram and see like, I post pictures of me like, grounding and earthing and hugging trees all the time and I plant trees and I have an urban farm where I live in you know New York City so I'm all for planting but if we're not listening to what the earth is asking of us then we're going to run into more problems if everything that we're doing is about saving our own asses and we're not showing up in relationship then we're going to continue in a really problematic, on a problematic path. And I'll give you an example of that. In Ireland, they, there was an executive decision that they were going to plant, there was a beautiful prairie, okay, and they decided to plant trees there. What do you think happened? Right, so it destroyed, the prairie already was incredibly diverse, and what happened was it became kind of like a tree desert. So all the diversity was destroyed, and it just became like tree, 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 tree. Is that going to solve these problems that we're in? I mean, probably not. So the question is, how are we going to learn to think in a nonlinear way? How are we going to learn to listen to what's being asked of us, rather than thinking that we have to come up with the answer by ourselves? So there are different kinds of knowing. And there's our cerebral, linear, rational way of knowing. There's wordless knowing, right, where you can look at someone's body language and know things. There's indigenous knowledge that has to do with a much more open and comprehensive way of knowing and connecting. There's collective knowledge, things that we know culturally. There's heart intelligence, okay, which I'm going to talk about now for a few minutes. And I think it's very relevant to how we're going to connect with the earth, how we're going to continue to have an invitation to be on the earth, and how we're going to 
be able to continue to be in a healing relationship with the earth. Okay, so the heart is an intelligent organ. And I'm bringing this up also because I just said plants are intelligent. And I just, I think, gave some convincing information, hopefully, to you that that's the case. And I want you to also think about our intelligence and our consciousness differently. Okay, because it turns out that the heart may actually be one of the primary sources of our intelligence, or organs, I should say. So we have all this language around the heart, being big-hearted and good-hearted, kind-hearted and hearty and follow your heart, right? Or the opposite, like being heavy-hearted or hard-hearted or heartbroken or heartless. Where did all this language come from? Why is it so central? Well, so now we can talk some about the science of the heart. And the heart has this electromagnetic field, which is measurable, okay? And a lot of this data, if you're interested, comes from the HeartMath Institute. So just so that, you know, if you want to delve deeper. But the heart is actually more powerful than the brain in its electromagnetic field. A hundred times stronger electrically and up to 5,000 times stronger magnetically. And there is a very powerful heart-brain connection where the heart actually and its electromagnetic field can affect m your own mood, attitude, and feelings, and also those of others. And we're not always conscious of that. But I'll give you an example of like you're sitting in your house, and let's say your roommate or your partner or spouse or whatever kid walks in. And you know before they've done anything, they had a bad day. OK? And you're like, Ugh, and you turn around. You haven't even seen them, right? But you're like, oh, somebody had a bad day. That's part of this electromagnetic field. It's measurable about six feet or so from you, OK? But there's a lot of data about how this has, you know, this is much more, I mean, it's a much more comprehensive thing. It's part of how we are able to know about, like, some people can know earthquakes before they happen, things like that. It's all related to this, the heart being both, being a sensory organ, OK? So it's an organ of perception and communication. And the way our eyes see waves and frequencies as colors, the heart perceives these as emotions and other things, OK? But certainly as emotions. And actually, the heart and brain synchronize, but when but the heart always detects before the brain. So when you have an EEG and an EKG on at the same time, you will see that the responses always begin in the heart before the brain. And there are all these ways that we can change this electromagnetic field, OK? So it looks a certain way in mental focus. It looks a certain way when we're like really disrupted and angry. And it looks a particular way. On the bottom, you can see during appreciation and gratitude. So I really want to highlight that, because doesn't that look really, really relaxing, that nice sinusoidal wave? That is actually, that state is something which can, can change not just the, your feelings and the people around you, but actually it changes your health, OK, which I'll show you in a minute. But basically, when somebody is in a particular state, particularly if it's appreciation and gratitude, then the electromagnetic fields within their cells of their heart will start oscillating in unison and synchronize, OK? It's called entrainment. And, and the electromagnetic field of the heart will synchronize with organs, other organs in your own body. And it will also, that electromagnetic field will synchronize with other people's electromagnetic fields and their whole body electromagnetic fields. And if you're in proximity with another person, like we are currently all in proximity with each other, we all have a shared electromagnetic field right now. As we have a shared microbiome, we will not walk out of this room the same way we walked in. Because we have shared a microbiome, we have shared an electromagnetic field, and we have shared an experience. OK? so. This is part of the way that we can, anything that has an electromagnetic field is something you can share. OK, you can share that. You can entrain with. Um, so basically, I just said this. But here's an example, a boy with his dog. OK, so you see there is the little boy, Josh, OK, and Mabel, his dog, are separate in separate rooms. 
Josh enters the room and greets Mabel. Look at how their electromagnetic fields entrain for this period of time. Then Josh gets up and leaves the room, and Mabel is sad and wants him to stay. And there, they kind of like, you know, go back into their own thing again. But it can happen with animals. It can happen with plants. It can happen with rocks. It can happen with anything that has an electromagnetic field. And all of these things do have electromagnetic fields, and we can share that. And the Earth, obviously, also has an electromagnetic field, yes? That's what grounding and all that data about grounding and earthing is related to the electromagnetic field of the Earth and why we feel so good when we ground with the Earth. Okay? So this is really powerful, I think, really powerful information, and it's a really powerful way that we can engage with, with Earth and plants and animals. Has anyone here ever had like one of these experiences where like a bird lands right next to you or a butterfly or something like that and it stays there for so long and you're like really having a moment with it? You know, or an animal walks over to you, something that you're like, is this really happening right now? So in those moments, that is part of what's happening. You're in a shared electromagnetic field, okay, with... Um, you know, with this animal. Just, just to kind of, and, the, and those moments are changing moments, right? Like you, maybe right now, if you can, you're bringing, I see, because I see people's faces, like you're bringing up these moments, like yes, yes, you know? These, those moments are moments which are pivotal moments. And that's part of how we're having communication with conscious other living, with life, with other living beings. Um, and here are some of the health benefits so things like um, cortisol levels go down, DHEA, which is another kind of hormone in the, in the adrenals, goes up, systolic and diastolic blood pressure comes down, um, and different kinds of psychiatric and psychological conditions improve, pre and post, okay? So the darker one is post, and you see basically um, like OCD, depression, anxiety, hostility, phobic anxiety, paranoid ideation, psychosis, all improve as people get into this state of gratitude and appreciation. I'm going to talk more about it a little bit. and I'll talk. In these cases, it was using HeartMath. They have devices, and you can actually, it, it gives a particular tone when you actually practice. Um, so it's getting into that state. And I have a friend, just as an example, who's used these, not, you don't have to use the device. I mean, I teach people how to do this, right? There's a lot of ways. I mean, you go outside and you feel like, wow, this sunrise is amazing and I am so grateful for it. You can get into that state. And as I was gonna say, my friend who does have this device, and I prescribe it sometimes to like people who feel like they need that kind of feedback, you know? All he has to do is think about his dog. He's like, I think about my dog Marley and ding, ding, like it just, you know, so it's a measurable thing. This isn't something which is like, oh, I'm feeling so thankful right now. I mean, yes, but also, and, and probably many of us can just do that without needing a device. But for this study, you know, and these kinds of studies, they're using devices. Um, memory improved also. So there are things that might cause us not to be in coherence, right? Coherence is when you're in this state of gratitude and appreciation. And some of the examples, and there's many obviously, but like, you know, people have PTSD or have been in violent situations. Playing violent video games is another example. So, I mean, I'm not going to get too caught up in that. I feel like, if anything, it's way too easy but, to be in a state of non-coherence. But what I do want to talk about now a little bit is also what's happening in the brain and the default mode network. And a lot of people have heard about this because they've heard about psychedelics through Michael Pollan's book where he talks a lot about the default mode network. But I want to touch on it because it's another part of this process of how are we going to kind of reconnect and get out of our, kind of get out of our heads in a sense, okay? So the default mode network is an area of the brain that lights up with activity when we have no mental tasks to perform and our minds wander. Okay, so it's kind of the default mode of the brain, and it's like daydreaming and self-reflection, and those sound kind of nice, right, except when it becomes ruminating and anxiety and 
right? It can kind of go to, to an extreme degree. And it actually can consume a disproportionate part of the brain's energy. And it alternates basically with attentional networks where you know, we're focusing and drawing attention to the outside world versus the inner world. And we think drawing attention to our inner world is a good idea, but it's just sometimes a little more complicated than that. So the default mode network is also known as the mean network. And it's kind of like the conductor of the orchestra. It manages and keeps all the competing systems of the brain working together and keeps other parts in check. And it's mostly inhibitory of our limbic system, which is where our emotions and memories are kept. But when it's shut off, that means that emotions and memories and sometimes things like long buried childhood traumas will float to the surface. So we're pretty invested in keeping this default mode network going, right? Because that's like, most of us are not excited to have those things happen. And basically, the other thing it's doing is allowing the brain to predict what's most likely to happen based on the least information possible, which is called predictive coding. So believe it or not, most of what we see is actually not what's really, 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 really happening. It's based on a couple of tiny details, and they're put together in a bigger picture by what's happened in the past. So it's sort of like we're in some kind of story that we've like been in before because what's familiar is what the brain kind of puts out there based on, okay, this, this, this. Okay, yeah, I can fill in the rest of that picture. Otherwise, we'd have to pay too much attention each minute to really know what was going on. So it's kind of an illusion woven from the data of senses and models constructed from our memories. And in our normal waking reality, it's kind of basically consists of a product of our imagination that gets confirmed again and again. Does this make sense? Okay. So a lot of what we see is based on familiarity and habit, and it's optimized by natural selection, right? Because every day, as long as we survive, we're like, yep, that was probably true, and this is what I'm going to continue to do. So there are some experiences that inactivate the default mode network. Mystical experiences and prayer can do it. Experienced meditators can have this. Holotropic breathing, which is like breath work now. It's called breath work. And I see, I'm seeing a lot of that. Sensory deprivation can also do it. Overwhelming experiences of awe. Fasting for some people. Certain psychedelics. And this is where the default mode network is now like the star of the show, OK? extreme sports, and near-death experiences. Okay, so these are what we know can inactivate the default mode network. Why is that important? Well, if you have a default mode network that's out of balance, then it can cause issues. If you have too little of it, you can actually have like psychosis and um, what's called magical thinking, and we could kind of get into whether that's always a bad thing, but let's say in the not good ways, okay? And then it can also, and it can also be seen, okay, so infant consciousness is also with very little default mode network function um, and in highly creative states. But if you have too much, too much default mode network activity, then it can lead to depression, anxiety, obsessions, eating disorders, OCD, addiction, a lot of the things that we're plagued with right now, many of us. So, Part of what I think is interesting to explore is how mystical experiences, which can be through breath work, it can be through being in nature, it can be through um, meditating, it can be through a lot of these different things. How does it change our brain so that we are in a more receptive space to be able to kind of um, perceive what we need to perceive better um, from plants and from the earth? because the neurology of mystical experiences is really interesting. Our distinct networks become less distinct. New connections spring up in regions that would not normally communicate. So we kind of understand things differently. The brain as a whole becomes more integrated, and it operates with greater flexibility and interconnectedness. With increased mental diversity, more thinking outside the box, long-term changes happen in personalities to become more open, and it facilitates neuroplasticity, okay? And this, in this kind of very rigid model of what we've been experiencing, there are maybe some arguments to be made for 
how are we going to be able to listen to the earth or even begin to think that plants could be conscious? You know, I mean, this is not something that is a widely accepted idea at all, despite the fact that there is a very kind of, I think, convincing science. And long since the beginning of time, an indigenous understanding of this. I um, mean, what's really interesting in particular in terms of the mystical experience, these hallmarks of the mystical experience are, number one, insights of mystical experience. And when I say mystical, I don't, I want to be very clear. I'm not just talking about psychedelics. I'm talking about awe-inspiring experiences in nature, deep meditation, right? I mean, in other words, going into this, what I call stepping outside of time, okay? So... Um, the insights of mystical experiences are felt to be objectively true, reveal truth rather than insights. There is a loss of sense of subjectivity. Boundaries between self and the world melt away, and there's a sense of non-duality or merging into the larger totality, and people feel at one with nature. That is a pretty universal aspect of mystical experience. So there is some basis for this idea that consciousness is something larger than we are, something shared, something that's not just in our brain, but it's in our brain, maybe also in our heart, maybe also in all the things around us. And the question then is, how do we engage with this in, in practical ways, right? How do we step into this new paradigm? And I kind of want to just take a moment to think about you know, who here has ever put compost down? Okay, I figured we'd have a pretty universal yes on that. So what if we thought of compost as an offering? Which it, kind of, it is, right? We're, we're saying you're feeding us and we want to feed you. That's a way that we show up with an offering. What about who here has planted a seed? Okay, also an offering. And one of the things that I always, you know, I always do, and I didn't actually put this in here, but I was taught by my teachers, and, and then I went back and talked to my relatives, that um, you offer song as you plant seeds. Do people here ever sing when they're working outside or hum, anything like that? You know, so <laughs> you're outing her, got it. <laughs> so, you know, so that idea, that's an offering, okay? Song can be an offering. Seeds can be an offering. I'll sometimes bring a stone or something else, you know? Like I always carry like some little stones and things that I found that I, are sort of special to me. And when I, you know, I was just harvesting a lot of mugwort, which actually grows totally, totally, totally out of control on my property. And I was harvesting it to actually use it to make smudge, to make little, you know, bundles to burn and other things. And I just, I offer something back when I do it and I, and I sing. The things that we do to invite pollinators and animals, that's actually, think about this, like the things you plant in order to invite pollinators, that's an offering, that's an invitation, okay? And this is like, how are we gonna change our language for actions that we already do, that we're already comfortable doing to think of it as being in relationship. Rewilding land. So I keep, partly because it would be too hard for me to not do this, I keep a part of my property totally wild. It makes my neighbors very, very, very angry. <laughs> they are upset. It's pretty tangled, but you know, um, there are rabbits there, there's um, possums that come through there, there's snakes. You know, and I live in New York City. I mean, I live in the Bronx, so it's not like straight up Manhattan concrete thing. But, you know, I see coyote come through my yard. I keep chickens, so that might be another reason they're coming. But that's not really meant to be an invitation to them. <laughs> you know, so, so but thinking about actually creating a space on, um, on your property intentionally as an invitation to wild, to wildness. This is a way of engaging that might be something comfortable, right? Something that isn't weird, isn't too spiritual, isn't kind of off like in some way that might for some people feel uncomfortable. I mean, for all I know, all of you are like building altars all the time and whatever, but I'm not making any assumptions, but just in case you're not, 
I just want to say that there's very basic ways to do this. There are other kinds of offerings like laughter and tears and silence and love, right? So these are also, right, thinking back to that electromagnetic field that we share, when we show up in that way, we are offering that. And I have a teacher who is a, a fourth generation shaman in Ecuador, and she believes in collecting tears and offering them to the land. Okay, and the land is something that transmutes, or trees, right? All these different kinds of entities of nature can transmute these things into, good, into kind of good, good things, right? Alchemize them. Uh, a lot of people will build altars. So an altar doesn't have to be something really like esoteric or anything like that. It can be any kind of space that you deem to be a place where you're able to set an intention it might be something that you feel you're making beautiful. I see them all the time when I go on walks in the woods or when I'm driving or other things. I'll see like, you know, like rocks in a circle or um, a few flowers in some way. And you can just, you'll spot them if you start looking for them and you're like someone was building an altar. So doing that, um, I learned from one of my West African teachers that something I could do that he likes was taking a piece of bread, spreading a little honey on it and putting a penny and offering that to trees, that the trees like that, OK? It, there are lots and lots of different traditions. It can be seeds. It can be a stone. It can be words. It can be any number of things. Meditation, right? Learning how to be quiet is um, a really powerful way, obviously, to start hearing if there's something to be heard. And the way that I, I've, I've been, you know, it has not been something that I've shared too much in my life before now, but since I was a little girl, I sang to plants and plants sang back to me. I talked to plants and plants talked back to me. Uh, obviously, that's not a very popular thing to share when you're in your neurology training <laughs> in an academic medical institution, but I think it's a time where all of us do have to embrace not just our scientific and cerebral selves that are so celebrated and our achievements in those ways, but we need to kind of learn how to connect and stand with our indigenous selves as well and be willing to push ourselves in that way and, and make it more normal. So meditation or labyrinths, many people, and labyrinths have a very like old and long tradition as a sacred act. You know, has anyone here walked a labyrinth? And it like thumbs up, thumbs down, eh, thumbs up. I have very powerful, sometimes just very powerful epiphanies. I don't walk labyrinths all the time, but I have had very powerful epiphanies walking through labyrinths. Even just like I remember feeling so sad as I was walking through a labyrinth in Santa Fe and thinking, as I was turning away from the sunset, I was like, oh, like I'm missing the sunset. And I was like, oh, I said, don't worry. You're gonna, it's, it's going to turn in a minute, and I'm going to see it again. And it was like so simple and so pro profound at the same time to be like, OK, like there are these like ways in life that like we don't feel we're walking in the right direction or we're missing out on something. And then like in a minute or in a whatever period of time, you're going to be back, and it's going to be, you're going to be going in the right the direction that feels good to you again, you know? It was just like very profound things that we can understand and things that we can hear and learn. Um, doing things like mantra, also, again, very ancient, ancient traditions. S spending time with animals. Does anybody here have an animal or a pet or just an animal they spend time with? Are you different with your animal than you are with the people or the rest of the world? <laughs> I, I won't use the voice that I use. I, I talk him back. I talk myself. Like, you know, it's, we get into a very different place. I think it's actually, I think that we could probably look at the default mode network during that time and see it was different, right? Because we're like, you know, in a whole different place. We're, we're, we're just in a, in a very new kind of energy that we're not always in. Obviously, time in nature. OK, and I've spent a lot of time talking about how powerful that is. Earth sits. Does anybody do this? Just go find a spot outside and just sit. 
try this and make an intention of doing it if you have not done this. Just and let yourself ask permission, right? This is a thing I always do um, that I didn't write down here. When I go out, even though I go, I go running in the woods by my house most days, I always ask permission, not always out loud, okay? You don't have to do it that way. As I go in, my, one of the, my students said, well, that makes it seem like I don't, always, I don't already have a relationship with them. You know, because I already do, and you know, why would I do that? And I'm like, well, okay, I have a relationship with you, but like, do you just want me to walk into your house without saying, hey, is it okay if I come in? Like, we can do this kind of create these ideas of this isn't just all for me. This isn't about what I'm taking. And for me, you know, that's true of nutrition too. All of these things are gifts we get. How can I show up in a relationship as kind of as a better partner in this relationship? Being in a state of awe. So for me, awe can be a lot of things, but being in nature is definitely a big one. But it can be listening to opera or listening to a poem or, I don't know, I would love to hear what are the things that you find bring you awe. But, you know, it, it's, there's no prescription for that. It's, what, it's unique. And obviously there are these teacher plants, okay, like tobacco, like the coca plant. And I bring these up in particular because, okay, so in indigenous learning, these plants are very powerful master plants. And I do a lot of work with these master plants, and I don't mean by ingesting them particularly, but having relationship with the plants. For me, that means growing them. For, they, for me, that means wearing them, okay? Like this is a piece of an ayahuasca branch. I think that is actually a way to be in a relationship with a plant that doesn't involve ingesting or, you know, whatever. But it also has to do with being it, having a huge amount of respect for those plants and not just saying, oh, what am I going to get out of this? Or I'm so enlightened. Or, oh, have you know, people will always say, oh, like, oh, like CBD. Like I went to this natural expo, this natural foods expo this year, and literally every booth pretty much was CBD this year. So, you know, it's really being in a state, being in this, again, understanding we're showing up in a relationship. And these plants, like the coca plant, when you don't show up in good in a good way for her, she will not show up in a good way for us, right? We, there is a reciprocal nature. These are powerful plants, and they can mess with us. Tobacco is another example of that. But here we also have plants like cannabis. And I could give a whole talk, and I do for my students, have a whole module on these plants, cannabis, psilocybin, ayahuasca, that have incredibly beautiful interactions with our physiology in ways that are transformative. And actually, again, I don't believe necessarily need to always be ingested or smoked or whatever those things, but um, we can interact with them by sitting with them, by wearing them, by other things that are much more simple. And part of the idea, too, is letting go of control. Okay? This doesn't mean surrender in our society sounds like we're losing, you know? But surrender is more about understanding that there's that we're not in control and that sometimes it's better that we're not in control and being able to learn in those moments to listen to what's being presented to us. And I think the more that we can learn to be in that state, the more we're going to be able to receive the kind of information, the nonlinear answers that may be really, really, really important in a, in a trying time, you know, in a trying time. So thank you for um, stepping out of your comfort zone with me today. Um, I appreciate it very much. And hopefully we are where the magic happens. You know, the way I think about terrain medicine, it's like many of us are activists, many of us are scientists. We're doing a lot of things to try to create change. But we don't always need to fight this old story when it's not working. It's just learning how to walk outside of the old story and, and build a new story. Thank you. So I think I have maybe about 10 minutes to take questions if anyone has any. Um, so an example, um, so the plants produce pheromones that can be measured. And 
I can't give you like a good name of a particular pheromone right now, but if you look in some of Steven Buhner's work, he, he has a lot of examples. And it's a, partly about how, for example, I'll give you an example of how it works is, I think he talks about like a chimp, okay? So when they have intestinal parasites, they will spend the morning searching out the particular plant that is particular for the parasite that they have. And they know to not just, that they can't chew it, okay, this particular one. They have to swallow, they, they fold it up and swallow it whole. And the plant, as their stomach acid dissolves it, puts the intestinal parasites into a coma. And then because it's whole still and not chewed, it's like Velcro and it just like sweeps them all up and takes them out of their body. And the idea is, and I can't, I wish I could give you, you know, better examples, but we kind of covered a lot of material. So is that there is a communication going on between the plant and a chimp or a bird or other things. And I can get, there are really good examples with insects, I think, where insects are called to particular plants, right? And we kind of know that it's, it's, it goes into, but it does extend to mammals as well. So I don't remember, but I think in that one it was an injection. But many times it could be also oral. It's not touching them. It's either going to, it's going to be a very prescribed, in any study like that, especially if it's published in Nature, you know, which is like a pretty premier journal, it's going to be a very particular amount. I believe that one was the inoculation was injected. It could have been oral, though. Yeah. So it's, if you look up, you know, mice, murine, norovirus, microbiome, you know, I actually, I think in the, I have the, a reference in the talk, too. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, and we know this children, teens, adults, when they're in a lot, they're in nature for a long period of time, they find it transformative. Absolutely. That's, I think, an amazing question. I've thought quite a bit about that. And I think we're at the very, very beginning of understanding what that electro, the size or the ability of that electromagnetic field to reach others, because it's definitely in my school, I kind of take this further into intuition and the science of intuition, this whole ability for us to know things that are happening on the other side of the world to people that we love or, you know, things like that are also attributed to tuning into this collective electromagnetic field. So the answer is probably yes, you know, but when, we, when I first talk about it, it's, you know, there's very, like, reasonable data that, you know, we have it six feet, feet away from us and so on, it's probably much more complex than that. So I would say probably the answer is yes. I mean, I think the hygiene hypothesis has really, for me, become the biodiversity hypothesis, you know, which is probably not really a hypothesis anymore, you know, but just knowing, I mean, as we look at the fact that, you know, being clean in most ways is not actually in our best interest, um, unless we're being cut open in a surgical, you know, like in an OR, <laughs> then, then yes, please, I would like to be very sterile in those particular moments. But other than that, being around diverse microbes, which is kind of basically mirroring what being outside is. And think about it. I mean, most of us didn't have our, we lived in huts or homes with dirt floors. And I mean, we didn't have these sealed in kind of places that we used to have until relatively recently in human history, you know, and kind of the more we've done that in many ways, the, the more we are plagued with kind of modern diseases. So in fact, yeah, I mean, I was just about to say that, you know, if you look, for example, like indigenous, like indigenous people living in the Amazon, they looked at their stool and their microbiome, the microbes of their stool were exponentially more exponentially like there was no comparison whatsoever to the amount that was in someone who's like in Western society versus people who are living in more remote, um, bi very biodiverse areas. And similarly, no autoimmune condition, no, none of that if they're in that environment. And I mean, again, you know, we'll talk about, oh, like they haven't had antibiotics. Oh, they haven't eat. They're not eating the standard American diet. Like, yes, all of that is true. But to me, there's also more than that. Having spent time in the Amazon, having spent time with Quechua people, you know, and Warani people and seeing the way that they're interacting with the natural world. It's just so, you know, 
they're with when they're in the jungle, they're with they're with their community. And when I say their community, I mean the trees, the plants, the animals, the ants, the you know, it's just all so I do think there's more to it than just like these sort of scientific measures, but absolutely those are there. Uh, well, no one told me that, so I do, but <laughs> um, I mean, I, I give grand rounds in hospitals, so it's not that people are unaware. My book had over 700 references in it. Part of why I wrote it was so that people could show it to their doctors or whatever. I mean, it's not all up completely about this stuff. It's, you know, a lot of what I talked about in the beginning in terms of microbes and food, which I talked about less because I kind of felt like other people in this conference are talking about that, but, and being out in nature and the science of that. So, uh, you know, I would say two things to that. I would say, first of all, there are um, more and more, I think, physicians that do that. Sometimes it's actually done totally inappropriately. Like they'll say, you know, someone comes in and and is having a really significant problem, and they'll say, well, maybe you should try meditating. You know what I mean? And it's like, dude, like, <laughs> this is like, you need to help them in a different, you know, if it's not something that they can treat with their usual kind of toolbox of medications or whatever. But on the other side of it, I would say it's really important for all of us. Like, things change because we change inside, not because someone else changes. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? So we each have to change and kind of take ownership in a certain way for everything else to change. And I would say like a great example of that is around organics and like GMO. When I first started doing this work, like organics or gluten-free things for that matter, certainly labeling GMOs were just not a thing. I mean, they were not such a thing at all. And I mean, I've been doing it that long. I've been doing it a while, you know, a good while, but it's not like I've been doing it for like 50 years. It wasn't that long ago. But people, you know, and I've heard many people, including like my uncle who's like involved in the food industry or whatever, be like, oh, organics is a fad. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, like we, when you, when we change, then everything else changes. If we're waiting around for someone else to change it, then no, I don't think it's going to change. So the more that you're kind of embodying, and that's why I'm kind of talking about these things, because if I'm not embodying that, then I can't expect anybody else to embody it either. Not because they wouldn't, but because I can't expect it unless I do it. Does that make sense? All right. Thank you very much.